Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during these presentations today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, July 14th edition of uh, Crop Talk. And on today's uh, Crop Talk, we're going to be uh, going through a few things. Uh, first of all, we're going to start off with a uh, update on one of our diversification centers in the province uh, and see what they're doing for uh, some research plots and trials for the year. Uh, Scott Chambers is uh, going to be presenting, and he's a diversification specialist. And uh, uh, Scott actually uh, did a recorded uh, 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 presentation, so we'll be uh, listening to that, and then. Uh, I'm uh, hoping he'll be able to be on the line on his, on his phone to answer some questions or some questions later on uh, after the presentation. And then we're going to get into our crop scouting panel and uh, deal with some of the issues that are uh, happening in the fields right now. Uh, we have uh, a guest to the uh, scouting panel today, uh, Tim Clark. He's one of the forage and livestock uh, people for uh, uh, Manitoba Ag, and uh, he will be uh, talking a little bit about some of the issues some of the uh, uh, forage and livestock people are having with uh, with the dry conditions. So, um, just with that, uh, Lori, we will uh, turn it over to you, and uh, you will start Scott's presentation. Hi folks, uh, my name is Scott Chalmers. I'll be presenting at today's uh, session of Crop Talk on July 14th, 2021. And I'll be talking about what's happening at Wado during COVID-19 in 2021. So down here in Melita, uh, I manage the nonprofit research farm called Wado or Westman Agricultural Diversification Organization. And we're part of a group of diversification centers across the province uh, that do applied crop research. Uh, so we have a site in Roblin called PCDF Carberry with CMCDC and up in Arburg uh, with PZA. And, uh, you know, with some of the good work that we do, uh, it all starts with good teamwork. And uh, so we have a uh, producer board of directors that help manage um, some of the uh, decision making and financials. We have uh, our staff that all work together uh, and we as part of some of the provincial staff uh, as uh, applied research specialists we all work together to uh, to move the results forward. And this is part of the research and innovation continuum within the province. So uh, like anything it starts with an idea at the top and that has to go through basic uh, and applied research. So we're right in the middle there. And then that has to be uh, extended to farmers and industry, for example, and then adopted. And then we constantly are getting feedback on these topics uh, so that uh, we can continuously improve. And we're getting that input from uh, maybe our board of directors, uh, institutions like uh, the University of Manitoba or ACC, uh, Brandon University, uh, commodity groups, uh, public and private sector areas, and our, uh, with that we put in our uh, provincial strategic initiatives uh, that the province would like to do. And so within this continuum we have all kinds of levels. We have the industry, the consumers, the universities, uh, our uh, colleagues uh, in the FDC, uh, or PAMI and the diversification centers. We have our Manitoba air culture staff and uh, of course the industry and consumers again. So down at Wado, uh, this year we have 55 projects which I think is a record breaker for us and uh, but we have about the same number of plots so that's around 2500 and uh, we spread that over five locations. Uh, we have one location in Reston 
three in Melita uh, at different spots, and then one around Elva. So uh, I was just going to discuss kind of what projects we're doing at Wado, and uh, we can start with maybe the seed guide variety trials. These are called the McVet variety trials. <clears throat> so we uh, plant uh, numerous varieties of each crop type. Uh, this year, again, we have spring wheat, oats, barley, winter cereals, so that includes winter wheat and rye. We have soybeans, uh, the Roundup Ready, the first year Roundup Ready, and then the conventionals. <clears throat> we have peas, dry beans, uh, and those are all, all different kinds of dry beans. Uh, the sunflowers are oils and confects. And then uh, we have grain corn and annual forages. And the annual forage trial is kind of a mix. It's got uh, millets, triticale, oats, barley, and even some intercrops this year. Uh, unfortunately, we were unable to get any hemp trials or canola trials this year, <clears throat> um, just the way things worked out. And if you're looking for the results, uh, if you haven't got the seed guide in the mail, uh, you can go on seedmanitoba.ca or seedmd.ca to, to find the, the latest 2020 results. And so the trials that we have now are generating the 2021 results uh, that will be in the 2022 guide. So let's start with the corn. Uh, we have, uh, of course, McVet uh, corn trials with the hybrid grain corn. Then we also, kind of in the middle here, uh, see if my laser will work. Uh, this is uh, a project out of uh, Ottawa where we're looking at the various inbreds of corn that they are using to create new hybrids for the future. And so they're screening through uh, various lines that they have of corn that, you know, may be suitable for our climate here uh, out west where it's uh, a little cooler, drier, and shorter seasons. So see how that goes. Uh, then we have a little corn vetch project here. Uh, as you can see, some of the green patches here, that's where the vetch and the corn are growing together, so they're a little greener. And then we have a little variety demo over here. It's a dryland grain corn demo, and uh, Barker's Agri Center are irrigating on their side the same variety. So we'll have a dry, dry land and uh, irrigated comparison. Next row crop here, we have the sunflower variety trials. And so uh, this variety that you're looking at here uh, is the talon variety for uh, oil seed. And uh, they are growing really well this year despite the lack of rainfall. I think we've only had three and a half inches on this plot uh, since snow melt. And uh, it's doing very well. And I think that's attributed to the no-till conditions and given that, this is even sandy soil, so uh, I, I really don't know how well or how it's even growing in the first place, but it's doing very good. I just want to note to all the producers out there that we're seeing uh, some rust here on our lower leaves. And just to make a note that it's out there, just keep your, keep your eye on it. But there's only a few spots, so it's not like it's getting out of control. Next up is the oat uh, trials and the barley trials that we have. This isn't really McVet, but they are variety trials. And they're in conjunction with uh, General Mills, for example, or uh, Solio, which is a uh, Quebec company. Uh, we also have a Quaker PepsiCo variety trial in which they're assessing lines of oats that they would prefer to use. Um, we have uh, a numerous number of trials uh, for barley with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Brandon and, and Dr. Anna Badia is our, our project lead on that and she has various uh, malts uh, that she's using to, to screen at Melita and they, uh, we have a Holus Food Co-op, a food barley that's a, a naked barley uh, which is really cool and uh, some advanced uh, food barleys as well. So really happy to have those trials here. I'm going to talk about some of the intercrops that we're doing too. Uh, some of the guys like to hear that. Uh, we have one project where we're looking at various intercrops with peas. And so we're putting in wheat, 
oats, mustard, canola, or flax with P, with the emphasis on P to see if uh, we can find any, you know, unique uh, advantages through the growing season or something to do with maybe with disease or harvestability. And this is the last year of a three-year project. Uh, we also have a project with peas um, looking at intercropping with mustard or camelina. And this is more of a project looking at the seeding rate of mustard and camelina with pea to see if we can get a or draw out a response against uh, a phanomyces or fusarium root rots. And uh, to date, uh, of course, we're still lacking quite a bit of data uh, from, from Lethbridge to understand really what's going on. But uh, to date, we really haven't found any large response, but uh, we still have two years of data to go through this year, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the results for that. So then we also have this project with uh, corn and hairy vetch, and uh, maybe I'll talk about that a little later here. And then we also have a project with Roquette, uh, the, the pea processor, in which we're looking at various seeding rates with peas, uh, with the emphasis on pea, of course, uh, with canola, oats, or barley. So here's a little look at the intercrop uh, project. Um, this is funded by Mantable Pulse and Soybean Growers Association, uh, WGRF, and CAP. And uh, basically, this is the one with the various crops with P. And uh, this is replicated both in Roblin, Melita, uh, and uh, Reston. Here's the Mustard P. Camelina project. And this is the one with the various seeding rates. And uh, uh, we recently just did some uh, root rot ratings here a couple weeks ago. Uh, the disease pressure was not as much uh, this this year round compared to last year and that's likely because we just haven't had the rainfall to stimulate disease as badly. Uh, however, I do know that that Alphanomyces is lurking in soil and it can be in the soil for for over a decade <clears throat> waiting to to infect uh, pea plants. So here's what uh, the roots look like uh, on the left there we have uh, healthy roots and then on the right of course is uh, disease roots uh, some of those are phanomyces and it's really conspicuous because the the uh, the disease doesn't look that bad in the field until the, the plots start to put up pods and uh, once that happens you can tell Things aren't just right, and uh, the plants will pull back and die um, slowly. So um, basically, the, the disease slowly kills the plant and draws all the nutrients out of the, out of what it's trying to gain uh, for itself, uh, and then it replicates within the soil, travels with the soil, so you can spread this from field to field, and um, so with that, you have to be careful not to to spread the the dirt from your tractor or uh, various sources um, and so we practice uh, uh, biosecurity when we go to this plot especially under mud conditions uh, so that we're not taking it back with us <clears throat> um, changing uh, intercrops here we have the roquette p and oat seeding rate trial uh, this one here emphasis on P, but uh, we're throwing in, you know, maybe 25-50% of normal seeding rates for oats. And you can see the treatment differences there, uh, they're quite apparent. And so we're pulling through with this with uh, economic analysis to see does it pay to have oats within the, within the uh, crop. And the last year that we did this, uh, it was, and this was a, a decent year last year, it was showing that, uh, yes, we are getting a yield advantage, maybe by 20%, but the economics of having to clean the or separate the crops from each other was actually absorbing most of that gain. And so there really wasn't a huge economic advantage at all. Uh, but 
The other things that we don't know is maybe there's some sort of disease advantage in which the oats are providing some sort of protection for the pea. And uh, maybe that is going beyond the economics that we're just deriving from the yield. Um, pea barley, same idea, just stepping up different seeding rates of barley within pea to see the effect uh, and, and take it into economics the pea canola as well so um, those are very good intercrops with pea um, mustard is another one that works very well uh, but as for the flax or wheat those are poor intercrops with pea because uh, the, the threshing ability to get to the flax or the wheat that is required smashes a lot of the peas and so that becomes a huge problem <clears throat> when you're trying to sell a high quality pea. Another intercrop that we're looking at uh, in previous years, we've looked at the, the, the rate of glyphosate to spray on um, corn and vetch. This is hairy vetch uh, to see, you know, what rate works best. Well, this year we changed it up a little bit and we're trying to find the magical rate of corn, the seeding rate of corn that works best with the hairy vetch and so we have a couple of objectives we want to look at both the grain corn side and see if we can maximize our grain corn production while still having some vetch growing under <clears throat> and then we also have the objective of the, the cattle grazer who uh, may want to maximize biomass within the system and uh, maximize that hairy vetch production so those two objectives may share a common seeding rate or they may be differ, and uh, that's what we're seeking to find out. And we also want to see if there's any differences in, in feed quality, for example, within the field system. Uh, we want to see anything that's maybe different in the soil uh, nitrate uh, or nitrogen balance so that uh, maybe we can reduce our impact of using uh, nitrogen fertilizers within the system and maybe start fixing some nitrogen with the hairy vetch. So with this, we have uh, three rates of corn. I think one was 20,000 plants per acre. Then we had uh, something like 25,000 plants per acre and 32,000 plants per acre. And we want to see the effect on the vetch. So either the vetch was on or off uh, on the plot and then the, the three seeding rates. So we actually have a, uh, our summer student is using this as their, their uh, Bachelor of Science degree thesis. And so we're really looking forward to working with her on this and, and getting some really cool results from it. We also have other projects on the go. We have uh, a faba bean row spacing project uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, we have a Fusarium head blight modeling trial uh, with the University of Manitoba. Uh, we have a serial seeding rate trial with uh, our own staff here, uh, Ann Kirk within Manitoba Agriculture, and that's looking at uh, low rates of uh, wheat, oats, and barley all the way up to high rates. So we can uh, under better understand stand establishment uh, and when it's important uh, either to maybe terminate or, or keep the crop based on, uh, on stand population. We also have a Ducks Unlimited Winter Wheat Fertility Trial, and this is looking at uh, comparing various varieties of, of high yielding winter wheat, but also um, the, the effect of uh, maybe not soil testing and soil testing and, and basing your fertility regime on that. Uh, so we're, we're kind of um, emphasizing the soil, the importance of soil test on that for high yielding winter wheat. We also have a flax or linseed variety co-op, uh, a camelina variety trial, which uh, I haven't had camelina at Wado for probably six years. Uh, again, we have our quinoa variety trial that's actually doing very well too. Uh, in uh, the dry conditions here. Yellow and brown mustard variety trials. Uh, this is with mustard 21. 
we have a dry bean variety trial, uh, actually two of those, one's McVet and the other one is from uh, Morden at the research center there. Uh, they're testing varieties they think might be great for out west here. <clears throat> then we also have uh, numerous uh, fertility trials and that's with uh, Dr. Ramona Moore from Brandon Agriculture Agri-Food Canada looking at nitrogen and phosphorus rates within dry beans. We also have uh, an inoculant trial with Kristen McMillan from the University of Manitoba looking at uh, various bean classes under different bean inoculants with uh, zero nitrogen. So uh, then we also have uh, a cooperator who's growing hops in the area south of Boisevain that we work with uh, quite diligently to, to help them with agronomy and scouting uh, and just managing a new crop uh, in the area. Uh, then we also have a small orchard in the town of Melita here. Uh, and I have some uh, no-till pumpkins and sweet corn growing around the plots. Uh, uh, we use our, uh, our vacuum planter to do this and uh, it's working very well. I'll uh, maybe show you pictures. So the flat or the fava bean row spacing trial we have um, four different uh, orientations. So we have the nine and a half inch standard solid seeded plot. Uh, then we have a 15 inch planted plot, a 20 inch planted and a 30 inch planted uh, row crop plot. So the idea here is, uh, you know, maybe when we're solid seeding, um, we're having issues with uh, seed clumping uh, during the seeding process. And so you tend to get gaps uh, which hasn't really been a big deal this year. We, we tend to drive slow, but uh, with some of these large seeded varieties, uh, a lot of farmers say they have a tough time getting the seed through the plenum of the air seeder and because they're so large. Uh, and so maybe we should be planting our fava beans. And uh, we thought since we have a planter that has a telescopic frame that you can change the the row spacing, let's try it this year. We had a bit of time and it worked really well. Uh, I was really surprised. Uh, we used uh, something like 110 pounds per square inch of, of vacuum pressure and it seemed to suck that uh, faba bean seed against the disc just right. And uh, you know, on 15 inch spacing, I think it was uh, two centimeter seed spacing between plants. Uh, and it, uh, it worked very well. So we'll see how that goes. We're taking some measurements from that, uh, such as weeds, uh, the yield, of course. Here's the linseed co-op. Uh, it's doing very well in this uh, arid uh, conditions that we're in right now in the drought. Uh, the flax looks great this year, uh, just except for the grasshoppers kind of moved in. So we had to take care of those guys that were getting on the flowers and the balls. Here's the Camelina variety trial. And uh, uh, this is from Christina Einick from the, uh, the CDC up in Saskatoon. She's got some different uh, varieties of Camelina she would like tested. And by the way, this crop looked great from the start. Uh, it, it germinated out of the ground, uh, I think, uh, the start of May. We only had maybe uh, five millimeters of uh, rainfall to get it going. We put it in at a half inch and it was right out of the ground uh, right away. So, um, and it's looked fantastic all year, even though we've had about three and a half inches of rainfall total. And so I would say this is a great drought tolerant crop. Uh, if you're in those conditions, uh, at least it's faring better than canola, I think. Uh, again, another drought tolerant crop here is yellow or brown mustard. It looks great this year. And of course, you know, they, it's more popular out west where there's, where there's less rainfall for canola. But uh, yeah, it's looking great. And this is with uh, mustard 21 in uh, Saskatoon as well, testing different varieties that they have. and. Uh, so we have this uh, in Melita in our Reston location. <clears throat> Quinoa, this is uh, another drought tolerant crop. Uh, I'd like to highlight 
Uh, it's doing very well in these conditions. It's the first plot we seeded this year, I think uh, at the end of April that we planted it and it's related to lambs quarters, for example, it looks exactly like it until it kind of grows a bit taller and, and kind of has a head to it. Um, this this project is with Filex or uh, Percy out of Portage who, who helps us uh, get seed for this and he, he's looking for different varieties for his company uh, to grow. Um, the one thing that we have religiously to do with this crop is, is spray an insect which bores into the stem. Uh, I don't really have a photo here but uh, it's a little pinhole in the stem and if you crack open the stem it's this, uh, this little maggot that to, likes to grow within the cadmium of the stem. And uh, if you don't spray for it, it'll it'll uh, reduce yield. But uh, so far, so good. Again, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Ramona Moore's uh, project. We have it's a three-year project funded by CAP and the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers Association. And so we're looking at uh, both pintos and black beans uh, for nitrogen use or nitrogen rates and phosphorus rates and within the nitrogen trial we have uh, um, we've inoculated and not inoculated uh, under various nitrogen treatments so it's kind of a, a nitrogen ramp we have uh, I think four rates of nitrogen and a zero check and then we also have the inoculant within that as a split factor and we have a couple of Super U treatments as well, and I just thought I'd show you a picture of that where uh, we have the zero nitrogen check and then the 105 kilograms per hectare nitrogen Super U applied that seems to be doing very good. Uh, and we're certainly getting some sort of nitrogen response in, in the dry beans, so looking forward to those results and. Uh, we also have a, a unique project with uh, ANNP in Winnipeg who are uh, looking at buckwheat as a potential nutraceutical and so we're growing some buckwheat to, sort of as a pilot uh, project to to get them some material to do some testing so this is actually my favorite project at Wado and uh, what a great year to grow buckwheat uh, of course only three and a half inches of rain but uh, we certainly got uh, two or three feet of a buckwheat stand here and uh, so yesterday we had the hay bind come through <clears throat> and uh, cut it down and so we're hoping to dry and bale it and get those bales to Winnipeg. And uh, here's our hops producer in Bois of Aine. Uh, he's got something like eight acres of hops he's growing with uh, several varieties which he supplies microbreweries in in Winnipeg with and uh, Randy does very good with uh, with growing the hops and we help him along with uh, doing uh, various things like scouting or nitrogen management or nutrient management uh, watering management and uh, if you ever get a chance uh, to, to have one of his brews uh, in Winnipeg go for it because uh, he puts his heart into these hops. And uh, with that, I think I'll finish my presentation. If, uh, if you are looking for results from the Manitoba Diversification Centers, uh, just go to mbdiversificationcenters.ca and go to results tab and you can find all our annual reports over the years uh, in which you can find uh, the actual numbered results from each of these trials and uh, um, with that, uh, you can also maybe look at our field days. Uh, um, I'm not too sure if we're really having anything in, in 2021 per se uh, because of uh, the COVID restrictions in Manitoba, but uh, uh, definitely, hopefully next year we can have an in-person event uh, or at least uh, maybe in the fall here uh, um, we'll get some presentations where we can meet up with each other. Event. Uh, or at least uh, maybe in and, uh, the if you're looking to get to the website here the QR code or if you want to follow us on Twitter 
here's each of our Twitter and, uh, handles, you're looking. and um, we try to post uh, some interesting tidbits during the year. And uh, with that, thank you for listening, and I'll be hopefully on the call here. I can take some questions. Okay. Okay, Lionel, it should be back at you now. Okay, good. Um, I think uh, Scott is on the line here, and I've got uh, maybe a couple questions for him. Uh, one question that came in is, uh, what is Camelina used for? We've got you there, Scott. You should be able to be heard now. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's okay. We were having a few problems trying to get Scott on here. So uh, what we'll do is uh, we're going to go into our uh, crop scouting panel. And uh, if we can get Scott on before the end of the presentation today, we'll get him to maybe answer a couple of questions. So uh, First question, and uh, maybe send this one over to Anne, is, is what's happening to uh, these wheat heads? Uh, and uh, Anne, mm -hmm. if you could uh, answer that one for us. Sure, yeah, we're definitely seeing, um, I've seen this on a few different cereal crops where we're starting to see some of those spikelets um, turn brown. And they are, some of them are aborting because of the very hot and dry temperatures that the plant just can't sustain can't sustain um, the number of seeds that have been fertilized, so it's just letting some of them go. So when we do see some of those, often we do see them at the tip of the spike, where you start to see, sorry, I have a, a child with a cough at home with me right now. Uh, when we start to see them at the tip with those brown tips, that's more where you would commonly see them. But you know, if you kind of just press on those brown spikelets and see that there's nothing growing inside, it's likely because they've been aborted. And I, I hadn't actually seen these kind of wonky um, ons where they're sticking out to the side instead of straight up um, before. I was thinking that perhaps it's if the spikelets are aborting that maybe those are drying off as well, but I'm I'm not sure. Not because sure. I hadn't seen that before. Okay, yeah, no, that was, I uh, uh, figured that's what was happening with the, um, on the head and, uh, I kind of was uh, wondering why it was happening more towards the bottom, and uh, and then the ons were something we were seeing pretty much throughout the whole field. Uh, you know, not a lot of them are not. You know, it's kind of one of those things you see it and it looks like it's a lot, but it's probably you know less than a percent or whatever that uh, are showing them. That it's just a uh, yeah, it looked like they were just starting to dry up. So maybe that would make sense that if it's uh, aborted on the on the head, then maybe it's drying up as well. Eh? Good, okay. Um, next question to Dennis Lang. Uh, noticing some of the pea pods uh, aren't finishing. What is your comments on that? I uh, just want to check to see if you can hear me, Lionel. You bet. Okay, perfect. I'm on my phone here today, and uh, so it's a little bit more uh, challenging. Anyways, uh, yeah. Um, with the recent heat that we are, we're seeing here, and especially in the, the sample, that the picture that you're seeing here, I think uh, a lot of, some of those smaller seeds are aborting now because of just, just uh, the uh, lack of mo recent moisture. Um, I think uh, depending on the area that you're in and the moisture that you captured uh, so far this year, um, some areas are gonna look really good, but uh, and some areas are, are looking a lot more stressed. So I think uh, in this situation here, it's just the, uh, the um, lack of moisture and the, and the uh, uh, high temperatures that we're seeing as of late here that you're going to see those some aborted seeds in those pods. So could anything else be, uh, be causing that? I know uh, the field we were in, um, it was almost waist height and uh, it looked like a pretty nice crop. I was just kind of wondering if there was anything else that might cause that to happen in a, in a normal, normal growing year or uh, just like in the things. No, I think for the most part, I think that's uh, there's really nothing at this point that would uh, be causing that, especially if the stand looks really good. Um, you know, you, you see that in a lot of crops that, uh, uh, you know, at a certain point when the crop is trying to conserve moisture, 
Uh, it's not maybe putting as filling as many of those seeds. We see that in soybeans all the time uh, on hot years when the seeds are filling that sometimes those, they, they have fewer seeds per pod on, on years when it's dry. So. Okay, and while you mentioned soybeans, uh, any comments on soybeans and how they're managing or handling some of this heat and dry conditions? Um, the soybeans are still looking okay yet. Um, driving around, you know, southern Manitoba here, uh, crops still look pretty good. We're kind of in that uh, R2 stage right now with, with lots of flowers and some fields may be maybe approaching the R3 stage. Um, with uh, some small pods starting to form in the in the uppermost nodes, and uh, the biggest concern I think right now, or I, uh, is uh, that rainfall towards the end of August, or, or sorry, the end of July and early August. Once you hit kind of R5, that's very critical for uh, for yield for soybeans um, because uh, that's when the seed is is forming and and starting to fill. So. Uh, for the most part, that's that's the biggest uh, biggest thing to kind of keep an eye open for. Um, the only other thing I'll mention about soybeans right now, um, last week we were called out to a field that we had suspected soybean cyst nematode in, and um, we, uh, we we as an M MPSD and uh, Mayor Chinuda from University of Manitoba had gone out to look at this field, and uh, in the headlands of, of this particular field. Uh, it was in, in southern Manitoba here. We were able to find soybean cyst nematode uh, on the roots. Um, the plants themselves look like, you know, stunted IDC plants that really never grew out of it all season. And in this particular case, it was a relatively small area compared to the rest of the field. Um, there were there were significant amounts of uh, soybean cyst nematodes um, on or cysts on the roots. And the cyst itself looks it's a very white. Um, uh, uh, cyst compared to a, a, uh, uh, a compared to a um, nodule, and it's very small. But in this case, it was very noticeable uh, on the roots. So that's one thing that I'm just cautioning growers right now: that if you're traveling out and about and you're looking at your fields and you see something unusual uh, in your field, as a spot that doesn't seem to be as green as the rest of the field, um, get out your shovel, dig out the roots, uh, gently remove the soil, and look for anything on the uh, uh, on the roots and um, any uh, any of these white cysts. And if you see something, uh, feel free to give me a call and we can arrange uh, some further investigation in that field. Okay, and uh, just one other question I've been getting from the pea producers is they uh, uh, feel that the beans are short, but they're gonna grow quite a bit over the next little while as they start flowering and, and starting to pot, right? Yeah, like typically it's, we're getting to the, again, a lot will depend on moisture, um, but um, once you have kind of like full pot set and, and filling, then you're then you're for sure you're done as far as the plant growth goes. Um, but it will be an overall shorter year for plant stands, um, you know, in, in, the, in the fields that I've looked at anyways, because we've just had, um, we've just haven't had the growth and we've seen that a lot of different crops, but uh, uh, I think the overall stands, unless you've gotten adequate moisture all through the season, uh, the stand, pea stands are going to be shorter than what they have been in other years. But then th that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing if they still stand up and they're still interlocking. It just means that uh, um, they're just not, they won't flop over maybe as much. So. Okay, great. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, next questions uh, are over to uh, Tim Clark, our guest uh, on the panel today, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, some of the uh, drought issues and dry conditions that's affecting our uh, livestock producers. So uh, a few questions that uh, he's going to address, and if we could turn uh, the screen over to him, he made up a few slides for us. Okay, can you hear me, Lionel? You bet, Tim, and we can see your screen soon. Okay, good. So, so I thought I'd put up the uh, percent of normal accumulated precipitation map from May 1st to July 11th, just so we can see sort of the differences throughout the province as to uh, rainfall patterns. So we see in, in large areas of the Inner Lake uh, and the West Lake regions, uh, these lighter colored areas, those have less than 50% of normal precipitation since May 1st. And then over on the west side of the province, you have large areas, you know, in around Riding Mountain Park and south of the park where they've had considerably more precipitation. 
So that's affecting the feed supply in terms of the production of hay and also the production of, uh, of green feed crops or annual crops. Uh, this combined with the fact that in June, in large parts of the inner lake and the west lake, there were some uh, quite hard frost. There was a frost at Fisherton that was minus seven, for example, and other frosts throughout the inner lake in early June, around the 10th, 12th of June. And, uh, and also they've had quite a bit of hopper pressure. So uh, their feed crops are not very good in those areas and, um, and their uh, pasture is not growing very well as, as a result of the triple whammy of, of low precipitation, hard frosts, and grasshopper pressure. <clears throat> so Lionel asked me to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that farmers can do to try and uh, um, some of the feed options they have um, in trying to deal with dry conditions. So one thing that farmers could do is they could cut annual crops that were intended for grain production for either green feed or silage. And lots of people are paying into lower areas of their native hay fields that have not been cut in recent years just to try and put up uh, some, some quality feed or some uh, roughage. And uh, there's been considerably more roadside and ditch haying this year as a consequence of the dry conditions. So the feed situation is quite variable from decent in the western part of the province to very dire situations in the Interlake and West Lake regions. And uh, so uh, Lionel asked me to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what a farmer could do uh, if he wanted to take a green feed or silage crop and put it to alternative use. Um, so if, if a farmer uh, seeds, say oats, and, he, and he's insuring through uh, crop insurance, if you put down oats on your seeded acreage report, then they are, they are charging you a premium to grow grain oats. And if you, they expect you to, to report a grain yield on your harvested production report. And if you don't, then they will put down a grain yield of zero. And if you say to them, well, I, I cut it for green feed, then they, then you cannot collect uh, a green feed claim on that because it's insured as oh, as grain oats. So if you're going to put it to alternative use, such as cutting it for green feed, you need to contact uh, MAIC immediately by phone or email and tell them on these acres, on these legals, I want to cut it for green feed. Then, then they will likely send out an adjuster and the adjuster will assess the grain yield and that will go in as your grain yield on your harvested production report. And then you can put it to alternative use, either cut it for green feed, or you could graze it uh, if, if, you, uh, if you need grazing days and you wanna use it that way. <clears throat> uh, here they talk about, for example, if the appraisal is 20 bushels per acre and you elect to cut it for feed, MASC will count these 20 bushels per acre as if they were your harvested grain, and then you could potentially get a, a claim payout on your grain yield, even though you cut it for green feed or silage. It's up to the producer to decide whether they want to harvest the crop as grain or put it to an alternative use, but an appraisal must be completed prior to cutting or adequate strips left for the appraiser to come at a later date and do an appraisal of the yield. So here you can uh, you could leave 10 foot wide strips, the length of the field, and the appraiser could come in afterwards and appraise that yield, and then you could either graze or or uh, or cut that that crop for green feed at a later date. Uh, as well, Manitoba Agriculture has our hay and hay listing service, and on it you can uh, you can list green feed that you have for sale, either standing or in bales hay and straw or pasture land that you have available or are looking for to purchase. <clears throat> Lionel also asked me to talk about cattails and bulrushes as a feed source. Uh, they're generally low feed value, uh, high in fiber, and so high fiber feeds are slow to digest. Um, so you would need to mix a high fiber feed like bulrushes or cattails with something like uh, a higher quality feed, like a grain type product, maybe DDGs or prepared feed. 
and mixing them off you can uh, you can get cattle through on some of the uh, what I call the shoulder months not the coldest months of the year maybe not December January February but on you know the Novembers and the March April type type time frames so that's basically what I had uh, <clears throat> oh pardon me I have to talk about nitrates um, Lionel asked me to talk about nitrates as well so plants normally take up nitrates in the water solution by a root uptake and convert them into non-toxic non-structural carbohydrates or plant sugars in the leaves during daylight hours and this is during normal plant gr growth if the leaves turn brown because of drought or frost then they cannot do this so when you see a frosted oat plant that's vegetative and then it gets a hard frost turns brown and then it won't green up a few days later then it's accumulating nitrates they can also accumulate in water sources such as uh, when livestock have direct access to surface water in dugouts or when water wells are situated close to a manure source when animals or humans consume nitrates the nitrogen atom displaces oxygen on the blood molecule impairing the ability of the blood to carry oxygen so in severe case you can it can cause asphyxiation or death so we recommend avoid feeding high nitrate feeds to sick hungry pregnant or lactating animals these animals have a lower tolerance level to the nitrate when compared to healthy cattle and try to make sure that all animals have access to plenty of clean drinking water as this will help to dilute the nitrate in the animal's body <clears throat> to effectively dilute high nitrate feeds you must have a feed test done and uh, this would be done at a lab. We have spot tests in the agricultural offices. The spot tests don't tell you the percent nitrates. They only tell you yes or no whether the, the vegetation has nitrates in it or not. So if it tests positive at a spot test at an, at an agricultural office, then you could send that sample into central testing labs and have it analyzed for percent nitrates. Once you know how much the percent in the feed, then you can dilute it down with other nitrate uh, contaminated feeds and get it down to the safe level of a half a percent nitrate on a dry matter basis. Animals will need to be adapted slowly onto feeds containing nitrates. After a period of adaptation of one to two weeks, the animal's tolerance level to nitrate increases and higher levels can be fed. However, if the animals are off high nitrate feeds for a few, few days, they will need to be readapted to the problem feed again if it is to be fed again. Adaptation periods can be set up by feeding limited amounts of the ration frequently throughout the day instead of one large feeding once per day. As mentioned above, low and high nitrate feeds need to be blended together to decrease the toxicity. This does not mean putting out one bale of low and one bale of high nitrate hay free choice because the animals may eat the high nitrate feed solely and have a toxic effect on the animal. Feeding supplemental grain, two to five pounds per head per day with high nitrate forages can assist with the dilution of the nitrate level. As well, the energy provided by the grain helps the rumen microorganisms convert the nitrite to ammonia, which can be excreted via the urine and feces. Balancing the ration is important when feeding high nitrate feeds since the nitrate level can increase the animal's requirements of vitamin A. So it's important to have adequate levels of vitamins in the diet, particularly if you're feeding high nitrate feeds. If the ration requires supplemental protein, avoid using non-protein nitrogen, such as urea, since this, since this can make the situation worse. And as I mentioned earlier, to effectively dilute high nitrate feeds, you must have a feed test done. And you need to, once you know how much is in the feed, you can dilute it to the safe level of one half percent nitrate on a dry matter basis. <clears throat> so that's all I had, Lionel. Uh, were there any questions? Uh, one is uh, the spot test, um, I guess, um, available at the uh what offices i guess is what what the question came the 10 ag offices that are left in the province okay okay and probably if they um uh, uh, 
call the one, I'll, I'll be showing the 1 800 or the one uh, toll free number here uh, at the end. And if producers want, they could probably call that number and uh, they'd be assisted in finding out which offices to go to for those tests as well. If um, they phone those uh, that number, they could also get quick access to the hay listing and uh, they could uh, get assistance to putting their hay up for sale or if they're needing hay on the same site. So just wanted to mention that as well. And um, oh, there's a question that just come up here. Just one second. Good, good question. Uh, I had this one the other day. Uh, any cautions uh, using sweet clover for feed or uh, the question I got was grazing at this time period? Well, the, uh, the native sweet clovers can have high levels of coumarin in them. Generally speaking, any of the more current varieties of sweet clover are low coumarin varieties. Coumarin being the, the product that grows naturally in the plant that uh, causes a thinning of the blood. Uh, so if you're, if you're just harvesting sweet clover that's just growing naturally, there could be levels of sweet uh, coumarin in it that could cause a problem. Generally speaking, we don't see very many problems of these nature. Uh, when people are growing it, uh, they're using current varieties and they're low in coumarin. Okay, and I think uh, one of the questions that came up too was uh, um, you had mentioned that like a lot of the ditches are being uh, cut and areas that haven't been cut in a while and a lot of those areas seem to have clover growing in them. Uh, so uh, w the stuff in the ditches being that it was planted, would that be low coumarin or would that be, or you wouldn't know on that one? I've heard, I've heard very few problems of that. Like okay. I, I just, it doesn't seem to come up very often. So my assumption is that it's, it's, it's not very, there's not very high levels in, in any of the, in the sweet clover that's grown in the province. Right. And, and probably anything that's uh, growing kind of native and, and wild sort of thing, there's enough grass in there too, that it's probably diluted enough that it's, uh, um, it's not going to be an issue as well. Right. Yeah. Generally speaking, there's grass around it and maybe some other species like red clover or alfalfa that won't have it. Okay. Great. Thanks for uh, answering those questions, Tim. And if, uh, if you can hang on till the end here, and if we get something else that comes in, uh, you can help us answer it as well. Sure. Um, John Goloski, uh got this picture uh, sent to me, and then I got a couple pictures from uh, about a, a year ago where I had seen this as well. So, uh, what's this showing up on the soybeans? I'm going to come into your office, Tim. We got you, John. <clears throat> Kim, you are self muted. If okay. <laughs> My there apologies. I, I, yeah, my audio problem at my end, and I'm in Kim's office uh, here. Um, anyway, um, that is a thistle caterpillar um, on the soybeans. Um, so they're, they're the larval stage of a butterfly called the painted lady butterfly. Um, some years we get a lot that migrate in, some years very little. They're, they don't overwinter here at all. They overwinter in the far southwest US and they have a purposeful migration north, just like Monarch. Some years they migrate in big numbers, other years very little. I have not seen a lot of painted ladies yet this year. I've seen a few, not a lot. So I don't think it's going to be a year where we see a lot of them. Now in soybeans, one thing to keep in mind is soybeans is really good at compensating for defoliation. So um, generally we suggest 30, 35% defoliation in vegetative stages, a bit lower in flowering and early pod development. 
Um, do keep in mind though, under dry conditions, plants can't compensate as well. And if the uh, defoliation is really intense and the soil is very dry, those are usually the, the exceptions where people may have to control them. Otherwise, um, thistles are actually their favorite food. Um, we've seen them clean up thistle patches. We've also seen them move off of thistle patches onto things like soybeans when people spray out the thistles. I've seen the same thing happen with round leaf mallow. So uh, again, um, I guess potential pests, not a major pest, um, and they do have a good side to them as well. Okay, and while I've got you on, John, I got the, this one I've been trying to get on the last couple of weeks here, but uh, what's uh, going on with the, the tree and the leaves here? I guess it's just yeah. on the... Okay, uh, what's the type of tree here, Lionel? Is that a... Uh, how do, how to, mm -hmm. It could be an ash tree, but regardless, those are galls. Um, so galls are... Um, I'll use the analogy of cancerous growths on the leaves of plants, and they can be caused by either mites, really tiny wasps, or uh, types of aphids. So those are the three main groups that cause galls. Um, and what they do is they lay their eggs right into the leaf. The leaf responds by producing this cancerous growth that surrounds the insect and becomes its home. So in each one of those, um, there would be either a mite or a tiny little wasp larva or an aphid that lives inside of it. Um, we, we see these frequently on Manitoba maples, oaks, um, and sometimes on the ash trees as well. Uh, that, I'm, I would guess that one's probably one caused by, there's a, a group of wasps called cynipid wasps that uh, make these goals. And, that's likely what that one is, although it's hard to tell until you really open it up sometimes. Okay, well, that's a, a coincidence because they had their garden close by and uh, they had aphids on their peppers. So They would be different species, though. Um, be yeah, you, the, the, the aphids that make the galls would be different uh, species than the ones you'd find on your in your garden. Okay, good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, that is going to conclude our panel for today, and I just wanted to uh, finish with a few uh, information slides here. Uh, once again, if you're a producer and you're needing to find uh, find water, get water, source some uh, those water projects, uh, definitely look at the BMP 503. Uh, it's available for you to access some funding to uh, to help. Uh, uh get you through the the uh the fall or rest of the summer and fall here um important uh again is the masc offices as we get uh closer to uh, uh crops being our producers making decisions regarding crops in some areas whether they want to uh, uh you know uh, green feed them silage them uh sell them to a producer that is needing feed uh, that's another good thing to be looking at doing uh you need to get a hold of your masc offices like tim mentioned uh and uh, get them to come out and do an appraisal of those fields especially if you uh hadn't said you especially if you said that they were going to be a grain crop for this year there's the uh toll free number uh again uh if you have feed for sale, if you are needing feed, uh, if you are looking for an area to take a sample to get a nitrate test done on, uh, definitely uh, give that number a call and uh, the person there will uh, help you in locating an area to go that would be closest to you. Uh, the Ag Adaptation Specialist, contact any of these people if you're in a situation where you want uh, you're not sure about uh, about your crop and the conditions it's growing in right now and or have questions regarding anything that's happening in your field uh, and uh, they'll be able to give you a hand. And uh, if there isn't any questions, Lori, uh, I think that'll be it for this week. So join us next week on July the 21st for the next edition of Crop Talk.